Yes, good morning, church. So for today's message, we will be continuing on the series of Second Peter. Now we are going to touch on chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. So right off the bat, before we start, let's read the Word of God and let's commit ourselves to prayer. So if we can have the next few slides. Okay, yes. Uh, let's all read through this passage together. So I will just read out loud and all of you can just go through the text and allow the Holy Spirit just to speak and you not know, allow the words to just jump at you, to allow the Holy Spirit to just speak through these words, okay? So I'm going to read it and you guys just meditate on the word. So Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. As you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of the Lord, the heavens will be on fire and be dissolved because of it. The elements will melt with the heat. But based on His promise, we wait for the new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will dwell. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at peace with Him, without spot or blemish. Also, regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you, according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things he speaks about these things in all his letters in which there are some matters that are hard to understand. The untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ." To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's just close our eyes and look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we know this morning that as we go through this passage in Second Peter, Peter being the disciple of Jesus has some heavy words for each and every one of us. As, although on the surface they may seem simple, but as today we, as we dive deeper into the Word of God, we know that there will be some truths that surface, that the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to us about. We pray that we are receptive to these things. We pray that as we sit here this morning, as we speak about the transformative power of Christ in our lives, we will undergo that transformation. That we will undergo that metamorphosis, a change of form in the hearts of the people. So we thank you. We pray that the word will be profitable, that the word will ring true in our hearts and the word will bring forth wellsprings of life for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> the title of today's message is How Then Shall We Live? And I'm going to do the message today a little bit differently, okay? We are going to have sort of a very general kind of look at the passage first and then we'll dive deep into just one section of the verse. Because eight verses is actually quite a bit in terms of <laughs> biblical text. So we are just going to look at one verse which I think brings out the heart of this whole passage. Now if we do this sort of segmentation, okay, we can see that verses 10 to 11, what Peter is trying to say is that on this life, whatever we do, it impacts the next. That how you live here on earth determines what will happen in the future. And I think this is very scary because Peter himself says that the earth and the works will all be disclosed. Now, if we are an open book to our husband and wife, right, uh, or maybe girlfriend, boyfriend, or to your parents, they know you. They can read you very well. They know how you react. They know the choices that you'll make. And there is a certain element of knowing you in a very personal sense. Now, if you open that book, to the whole world knowing all the deeds that you, you, you do. It's kind of a scary thing, right? Like, oh, I know every single thing that you do. 
most of us would not want that. In today's world, it's all about privacy, right? Like how we protect, don't let people know what you do or on this, like where your location is, what you share in terms of like your online cookies and all that kind of stuff like that. But this is the exact opposite that Peter says when the world is destroyed, when we all go to judgment day, where there is this, this when we go to eternity and stand before the Lord, everything will be disclosed. And he says that since everything will be disclosed, how then do you think we should live? That it is clear that we must live lives that are holy and godly because it will be there on display for everyone to see. Heavy words, right? That's why I bring the baby up first so that you all can like, ah, a bit there. Okay, anyway, uh, the next point is that when we live, we have to live in anticipation of the end. Because as you wait and earnestly desire the day of the Lord, which is whether Jesus comes again first or we go to Jesus, right? We, based on His promise, we wait for a new heaven and new earth. We wait for a new creation. We wait to enter into a new life where, where, where our bodies will never perish, where we will never, never be hungry, that there will be no, no sadness, there will be, be no pain, where the righteousness of God dwells 24-7. I mean, at that time, there's eternity. I think there's no point of having 24-7 or time. There's no scale of, of, of time. It doesn't matter. It's this whole brand new reality that we have to look forward to. And this is what Peter is saying, that live right now looking to the future. You don't live right now for now. You don't like live in the moment, YOLO kind of thing. You know, he says, live right now in view for the future. And the next section is that in view of your salvation, strive to live a sanctified life. So in verses 14 and 15, Dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at peace with Him without spot and blemish. Regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation. Now, what this means is that Peter is just pointing us to the fact that firstly, okay, when I was young, uh, in the 80s, 90s. Okay, I'm not that old here, depends on. Not that old. Um, but in the past, there was this theology that was going around that was just not one safe, always safe. So it's a very, I wouldn't say Calvinistic kind of view, but is it that very deterministic kind of thing? So if you are safe, know that your salvation can never be taken away from you. But when you read in Peter here, you get a sense that he's trying to say something that is different and opposite of that. That salvation is provided to you as an opportunity. That God is patient in a sense where we live our lives. Where God has not yet destroyed the earth. The end time has not come. And this is what he refers to as the patience of the Lord. And having this time given to us, it is an opportunity towards our salvation. Which means that salvation is not something that we can take for granted. We don't live our lives and walk around and, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday, you know, and just like, yeah, I know that's that's all there is to it. No, Peter says, please, don't do that. Regard this time that you have as an opportunity to work out your salvation. Okay, we will see more about that, but this is just the different sections. And lastly, be discerning to remain in the truth. And there are some matters that Peter writes about Paul to say that he teaches some very difficult things to understand. But there are a group of people who twist all these things to their own destruction. And he says, be on guard. Since I have written to you, since I have told you these things, it means that you have to take extra caution, double caution, so that you do not fall into the trap of these people. So these are the four main segments that um, are covered in the passage today. But what I want to do is point us to what I believe is the main point of this section, which is verses 14 and 15. And this is where Peter is talking about a sanctified life. Now, I want to use scripture in order to proofread scripture, or in a sense to make it more, I'm sorry, to make it easier to understand. So in verses 14 and 15, we can parallel it with two different verses uh, written by Paul. So it's like two different people saying the same kind of things, which probably I don't think they collaborated. So verse 14 where it says, Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at peace with him without spot and blemish. It's essentially what Paul is saying in Philippians 2, 12, um, b the second half. And where he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not something that we are to take for granted. But the Christian life is something that we have to live out in excellence. And this parallels a lot of things that Paul writes, right? Like run the race with, with all your strength. 
uh, things like, you know, since there's a big crowd of witnesses, that we can cheer us on to run so that we may finish in a way that is worthy of the prize. All these things talk about the same thing, that, that, that there is this salvation that we are working towards. And Peter here is saying the exact same thing as well. And in verse 15, where Peter says, regard the patience of the Lord as an opportunity for salvation, is just another way of Paul saying, working together with Him, we appeal to you, do, don't receive God's grace in vain. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 is that when the gospel is preached, when the hearts are moved, when all these people accept Christ into their hearts, and the apostles see all this work out there to be done and they are so overjoyed. But there is a group of lawless people who are perverting these words of God, who are changing these words of God, who, as we know in the different churches in the New Testament, that they have licensed sin, that they have pushed people back to legalism. And this is the kind of culture that they are looking and they are saying, don't squander the salvation that is given to you. I know this is a radical thought today. I don't think we have ever heard this from the pulpit before. But don't waste this gift that you have been given. That you don't assume that just because I'm a Christian today, it means that it will forever be like this. No. That we are working towards greater glory of God within our lives. And we run that race with fear and trembling. And we don't want to discount ourselves by saying that we are going to follow some other teaching you know, or to to license sin or to go through all these unlawful teachers and, and ourselves being stumbled. And this whole section that Peter is writing about can be summarized as what we call a sanctified life. Now, I want to pause us today, and I know this is a little bit unorthodox, but I do want to give, in a sense, a short auto call, a short time of reflection. Is that God calls every single one of us to salvation. But if at any point, maybe you're sitting here in the audience today and you feel that you know you're a Christian, but you know that there are certain things that you should not be doing in your life, that if you are still living certain parts of your life in sin, or maybe certain parts of your life that you still are rejecting God, then I think this is God's call for you today, that He wants you to live your life in view of your salvation to experience that transformative sanctification. So let's just take a short moment and just pray for us. Okay, I'm not going to ask for anyone to respond, but this is the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's just close our eyes and I'll say a short prayer for us. Father, we know that we have been called as babies to the Lord. That you have taught us to crave spiritual milk, to grow, and as we grow, to crave solid food. Lord, we know that this is a journey of sanctification. That we all start out as small babies, but we are called to grow to be more and more like you each and every day of our lives. So we pray for anyone who is sitting in the audience today who may be struggling with living that Christian life, who may be struggling to say that, Lord, I want to choose you in every single thing. Lord, I pray that you send the Holy Spirit to them to tell them that you have given the gift of salvation, that you have given them the gift of sanctification, that you have given them a new life and a new heart to pursue you. So we pray that all these brothers and sisters will trust and to rely and to really find themselves in Christ, to be lifted up in heavenly places, to reject the sin and to choose Christ. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. So today's main point that I want to jump to is how do we live sanctified lives? That we know Peter has been calling us, right? That we need to live godly lives. We need to live holy lives. We need to be excellent in all these conduct. And this is the point that I want to bring out today. That make every effort to be found at peace with him without spot and blemish. The question is how do we live sanctified lives? And... One issue that I feel, okay, maybe it's not a personal thing, but it's a general observation in many years of ministry, is that as Christians, we tend to get caught up in the exercise of drawing lines in the sand, okay, and I know I put arbitrary lines, to define what the ideal Christian life looks like. And when we look at this process, it is a very simple one. When we raise our kids, okay, uh, I know that being a dad, I... I re-examine all these things that I say all over again because sometimes it may be unfair. So I need to think how I want to raise my son, right? So I asked my, um, <laughs> no, my, myself in a sense, how do you raise someone to be a Christian? 
most of the time we draw lines in a sense, right? To say that, oh, a Christian should not do this. A Christian should not do this. And to a certain extent, many people feel that this can become something that is very judgy. Oh, a good Christian doesn't do this. And all that kind of stuff. So we draw many lines in the sand and we use this to gauge how good a person is or how good a Christian we are. And whether we apply it to other people or whether we apply it to ourselves, uh, yes, it does matter, like don't judge people. But what I, I want to draw up this, to this point is that it's actually quite arbitrary. If we do this thing where we draw, you know, like two circles here, like a Venn diagram, and says that everything that belongs in this circle is Christian, and we should do it. And everything that belongs in this circle is definitely non-Christian, and you should not do it. And whatever is this overlap, becomes like something like questionable, right? Then we always like to use the verse that Paul says, all things are permissible, but not everything are beneficial. So it's like all this grey area that we kind of like live in you know, and try to navigate in that sense. And in our minds, when we see someone who is like the ideal Christian, it means that they are living up in the full circle on top, right? They are, they are full on, you know? and we always praise, oh, what praiseworthy lives and all this. And this is usually how we see Christianity. Uh, I'm here to say that I want to tell a story. Okay, story first. Okay, so uh, of course every story has a point, so I'll use this to illustrate my point, but I just want to break up the monotony before it becomes too serious. Okay, so story time. It's more of a joke, okay? So there was this guy, and one day he woke up, and he was looking for his wife at, at, at home, and she was missing. So he opened the door and looked down at the driveway, and his car was missing. So he's like... My wife and car are missing. Okay, so he faster called the police and say, police, 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 I don't know what happened. I woke up and my wife disappeared and my car also disappeared. Okay, so the police said, okay, come now, come now. Okay, we'll treat this as maybe a missing person's case. Okay, so what we need from you is tell us a description of what your wife looks like. Okay, so he says, okay, okay, okay. So they ask her, what color does your, uh, what, what color hair does your wife have? Then he think, I think brown color. I think maybe she dyed her hair brown. Okay, then say, okay, what color are her eyes? Then he think, think, think. I think blue, but maybe green. I'm not too sure. Okay. So he said, okay, so can you remember how long is your wife's hair? Then he think, think, think. I'm not too sure. I think shoulder length hair. Okay, then he said, okay, so on the day that they disappeared, when, the, when you last saw her, what was she wearing? Then he think, think, think. I don't remember, you know. Uh, I think could be a dress or could be like a shirt and jeans. I don't know, okay. So, okay, so police say, okay, 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 don't worry. We'll put all of this, this description down. So then the police say, okay, so your car, you say she drove away with the car. So can you tell me some details about your car? Oh, yes, my car is a Porsche 911 GT3 RS with aftermarket exhaust and <laughs> racing body kit. With, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so the point of the story is, <laughs> sorry, the point of the story is that we always caught up in, in things that may not be the most important, right? Like we, this guy knows so many things about his car. He loves his car so much, but he forget that the point of you not know, being a husband is that he needs to be a good husband. He needs to pay attention to his wife, right? And it's always this kind of like prenatal, like always existential. The wife says, like, you never pay attention. I cut my hair one inch shorter. You never notice kind of thing. No, like always that kind of thing. Like, like pay attention, guys. Pay attention to your wife. Okay, don't ask Diana whether I pay attention. To her. You know, just okay. Of course I do, guys. Okay. Hey, yeah. Maybe don't fact check. Lah. <laughs> okay, but I mean, we try our best or uh, to uh, the best of our abilities to be best. And to be best in all these things means that we need to actually find out about some of these things. And the problem is that we are so caught up on this idea of what an ideal Christian life is that we forget that it is not universal. Okay? Um, if I want to take, for example, what a Christian life here in Singapore can look very drastically different from what a Christian life is in another country, 
right? So in Singapore, we have like freedom of religion and all that kind of stuff like that. And we may think, like, oh no, why should I? Shouldn't all Christians should just wear a cross? You no, know, if you wear a cross, everybody know that you are Christian. And then you no know, people will say, like, oh, you're Christian. Can you tell me more about Jesus? You know, it's a very like ide- idealistic kind of sense. But that may not be applicable because if you go to another country where religion is persecuted, you wear the cross, then you will face persecution, right? So that's just a very obvious and simple example to say that not all or not everyone's lives look the same. And if we just simply draw lines in the sand to define what is a good Christian and what is a bad Christian is how, as I described it, it is arbitrary. Now, I want to introduce you before I can um, go on into this whole idea of sanctification and what a sanctified life actually is. I need to go through the Old Testament concept of what is clean and common. Sorry, what is clean versus common and unclean. So we, in in Paul's theology and Peter's theology, you'll see a lot of this imagery, right? Like what is clean, what is unclean, what we should do. And sanctification essentially talks about our lives being clean. So in the Old Testament, the only objects that you can use to worship God are objects that are clean, okay? So let's take, for example, the Levitical law. If you walk, 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 walk on the road, and then you see a dead body, you know, or a person who has died there. And then being a very nice person that you are, you took the dead body and then you carry it, right, so that you can bury it to honour the dead. The problem is if you do that, you become ceremonially unclean. So if you were on the way to the temple to worship God, and then you do that, you will not be able to go to the temple because you are unclean. So what happens is that you need to go through a ritual cleansing, right? So that you can be clean and go into the temple so that you can worship God. So that is this Old Testament concept. And the concepts are, is that the objects that are unclean or, sorry, the objects that are common or unclean can be made clean again, okay? So I'm not saying that every unclean thing can be made clean, okay? But the common things can be made holy or clean. And some unclean things can be made clean again, okay? So there are some unclean things that will always be unclean now, okay? So the whole idea here that we use in the New Testament is based on this. That whatever Peter, whatever Paul writes is based on this imagery. So when we look in Psalms chapter 24, verse 3 to 4, it says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not set his mind on what is false, and who has not sworn deceitfully. So this whole concept here tells us something very important about what sanctification is. Is that this is the exact same concept that happens in our lives. Are our lives becoming clean for Jesus? Because sanctification is the process where our righteousness is being built up to the same level of righteousness that Jesus imputes to us on the cross. When Jesus died for us on the cross, He has given us His righteousness. It does not mean that we are actually righteous, right? We are still sinful people. But when God deals with us, He deals with us as though we were righteous because we are given the righteousness of Christ. But our life has to live up to what God has done. And that is the process of sanctification. And for us to live out that process of sanctification, that whole process is called salvation. That we are being saved every single day. We are being saved every single moment of the way. That we who are unclean are being made clean so that we can please God, so that we can worship God. Now, the problem here is that we get so caught up in the actions of these things that we forget to consider how clean we are. And the whole idea here is that it's not the actions that these objects do that are clean or unclean. It is the object themselves. In the temple last time, when you pour out the flask as you know, as a, 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 a sorry, as a um, uh, the pour out offering, it's not so much whether the action of that pouring is clean; it's whether the cup is clean. And in our lives, it's not so much whether how we live it is clean, but whether the person living it is clean. And this is the crux that we are looking for in this whole. 
passage in 2 Peter, that we should not be so caught up in what are the Christian things to do, but rather whether we ourselves are clean. So this is how sanctification works, is that we have our own life. And it's not some like, you know, you draw a circle, or the Christian things here, if you do these things, it means you are sanctified. Here, if you do all these non-Christian things, you do here, okay, it means you are not sanctified. That's not what it means, okay? It means our life is our life. There's no separation, okay? It has nothing to do with your actions. It has nothing to do with the things that you do. It matters with who you are. Okay, so there's only one circle, it's just who we are. And in that circle, we are surrounded by the covering of the Holy Spirit. That now that we have Christ, the blood of Jesus that covers each and every single one of us, the blood of Jesus that washes us clean, right? It's over our lives, it covers our lives. And what happens is that we are being called to push the sin out from our lives, to be sanctified to reject the things that are not of God. That it is always, always about the person. It's not always about the choices that we make. You know, in today's generation, we have this saying, right, that, uh, you know, you make it, sorry, you fake it until you make it, right? So you pretend, okay, like if you try to apply for a job that you are not qualified for. I mean, we're not qualified to live the Christian life, right? It's, it's really hard, right? So the idea is that, is that okay, so you just go, right? you sit down at a job, and then you pretend you know how to do it, okay, until finally one day you actually learn how to do it. No, it's, okay, it's not, it's, that's not what Christian life is. We don't fake all these things, right? You don't fake all these things. The substance comes from us. And this is the substance of things in this New Testament reality. That our lives must be made clean. And this is how sanctification works. So it is not about what you do, but about who you are. Romans 6, 12 says, What then should we say? Should we continue to sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now, I know many of us feel that this statement is a very question statement, right? Like a very gentle statement, like Paul is trying to persuade you all. Hey, you know, how can we who die still... No, this is not what Paul is trying to say. Paul is making an absolute statement here. He is feeling that anyone who says that I am a Christian and I want to sin more so that God's grace can abound, he is incredulous. He is like... What are you talking about? What on earth are you trying to say? This is not a statement that a Christian would say. This is what he's saying. He's, he's feeling so, so that, that this is such a ridiculous thing to ask. And he's saying, how can we who died to sin still live in it? It is an impossibility. Anyone who has Christ that is alive in them, anyone who has the power of the Holy Spirit, will not say, I want to sin. This is what Paul is saying here. He's talking about who you are. It's not about all these actions. It's not about saying, oh, so does that mean I can sin? No, he's not talking about where, where, whether we want to do those actions. He's talking about the heart, the person. It's always about the person. And he says, who you are is not possible because you have Christ in you. And Jesus will not allow you to do these things. So, the whole idea here about how we should live our lives is not so much that we should ask how we live our lives, but we need to ask who lives our lives. And in Galatians chapter 2, 20, this famous verse, we have gone through many times that it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, it sounds very simple when we focus on this whole idea that Jesus gave his life for me. I love him. But again, Paul is talking about the action that is on our part. That we no longer live, but Christ who lives in me is living out this life of salvation, is living out this life of sanctification, is living out the power of God that we are unable to. And Paul is not saying this in a very passive way where I just left like, oh, you know, like, yeah, yeah. When I get to, you know, <laughs> um, recently we were doing re renovation. So, so Deanna liked to quote 
her, her dad on this, right? Like, when you reach the bridge, the solution will present itself kind of thing. Like, that's not what G- Paul is saying here in terms of what Jesus does in our life. What he's saying here is that we ourselves must be an active participant in this. That we ourselves must say that I deny myself. I don't choose the life that I want to live, but I choose the life that Christ wants me to live. This is what Paul is saying here. It is a huge sacrifice. So how do we live a sanctified life? can be summarized in one very simple verse. And Matthew 16, 24 says, If anyone who wants to be my disciple, they must pick up their cross and follow me. And the question is, when we live our lives, have we picked up our cross? Or if I want to paraphrase it, have we picked up this extremely heavy burden of doing something extra, something further, something that may be deemed culturally shameful? Have we borne many of these things in order to live a life that pleases God? Now, I have covered all this theological... (laughs) It's very deep, right? So what I want to do now is that I want to bring it out to an application. And I know this may sound like a simple portion, but I feel that this is the part where everyone will get angry at me because theology is very easy to... Yes, amen. But then once we start to apply, okay, then okay, y'all will see, okay. So how then shall we live? That is the big question. How does Peter say we should live in 2 Peter 3? Uh, how to live a life that is godly, a life that is holy? Well, I will summarize it very simply as to live a normal life as a child, sancti- uh, live a normal life as a sanctified child of God. So what I'm trying to say here is that your life should not look extremely different from what your reality is, right? Uh, Maybe I want to give an example of this. When we got married, now we have a child, right? So all my examples will be children. So now that I have one child, people will ask, so when's your next one? (laughs) No, I'll be like, oh, okay, 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 okay. Which is actually a very Christian thing to ask, okay? So I'm not offended, okay? I'm not offended. I I know we did that video, right, about I don't ask about, hey, where's your next child, right? Then I pretended to cry. You all saw that video? Okay, never mind. Okay, uh, (laughs) so... So it's a very Christian thing to do, right? In a sense, it is a very cookie-cutter life when I'm looking at friends from, not you all, are friends from other churches, okay? Other church Christian friends. It's a very cookie-cutter life, right? They, they, they pump out like three kids, buy a five-room flat, you know? Uh, when you ask them, like, oh, how you all survive? Then they'll say things like, yeah, the Lord will provide. Yeah, I'm not saying that the Lord hasn't provided for me, right? A lot is good. The Lord has been good. But, you know, like, maybe we only want one child. <laughs> maybe kind of thing. So, I'm not saying there is a right number of children, right? But what I'm talking about is going back to the, or my original point, that we always have this view that there is a cookie-cutter Christian life. We always view that, you know, oh, this is just the Christian things to, to do kind of thing, right? It's, it's a very... Kind of like, okay, I won't say we feel pressured to follow, but let's break out of that, right? Let's ask not our surroundings how we should live, but let's ask God how we should live. So live a normal life as you would, just, just a normal life, but as a sanctified child of God. Remember that circle of the Holy Spirit that surrounds us? This is where we need to apply it. Our life is our life. But when we put the Holy Spirit around us, that is when the sanctification comes over your entire life. And this is how we will apply it, okay? Don't get angry at me, huh? Okay, so live your life. Uh, we are in the process of moving house because, you know, um, I see my son no place to run, so we need a bigger house. And in this process of renovation, uh, there are a few things you need to consider. Renovation is really expensive. So there, there's all this idea where form follows function. So in this design philosophy, it means that if you design a cup, right, it doesn't matter how nicely you design your cup. If you drink and then the water spill out from the side and pour all over you, it doesn't, that's a lousy cup, right? So, so always the function of the cup is the most important thing. So I was looking for... Interestingly, taps, lah, okay? It's a very mundane kind of example. So we were looking at taps. 
and we saw on Instagram, I think most of maybe the y- younger people, you all have their feet, you know, where they have like the kind of the Starbucks kind of cup cleaner where you take your cup upside down and then you press it on this water jet and then the water jet will spray and then, you know, kind of thing. Then, then you clean and you go, oh, you have a clean cup. You don't even need to like move your hand kind of thing. Then you're like, oh, this is so amazing. Right, right. So I also thought, I also want to put this into my new house, right? Save time, make your life easier, spend more time with your family, right? Now. So, sorry, bro. Then after that, you read the reviews, uh, people say, no, don't buy this thing. You, you know why? Because you spend less time washing the cup. But after you wash already, right, you find that the, the, the mechanism, you have to wash it every single day. You know, because, no, it's true, because when you see Starbucks, all this, right, they hire people to go and clean, uh, you know, people drink, then, you know, get stomach air, that kind of stuff. So if you do it at home, someone needs to clean it, right? So they say, if you don't clean it, it will grow more and fungus. And next time, you are just washing your cup with more, right? So, so, they, so <laughs> the idea is there. It's beautiful, it's nice, but it doesn't serve its purpose, you see? So we were looking at our, our kitchen tap that we wanted to replace. I'm not ashamed to say that we bought IKEA for our current house. Okay, so it's, it's just the one that you can move left and right, you know, and then the head comes out. It's a, it's a normal tap, lah, okay? So in our new house, we said that, oh, okay, we, you went to some of our friends' houses and they installed the one where you can pull the hose out and then you can wash your dishes and you're like, wow, so convenient, you know? Then the water jet will spray the thing very nicely and then you can angle the thing so that the water don't spray out and then, you know, the fungus grow everywhere around the sink kind of thing. So you say, wow, very nice, very nice. But the problem is that those taps are very industrial, very functional design kind of thing, right? Like, it's not, it's not beautiful, like, it's a tap, like, you know, kind of thing. So we look, 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 okay? And then we saw, wow, there's this very beautiful one, matte black, you know? with the curves, you know, and all that kind of thing. I said, wow. Then I look at the price. Wow. <laughs> 1006 for a tap. Unreasonable. But I use this as, as an illustration because, because God wants us to be that tap. Okay, I know it's also like a very ri- ri- ridiculous thing to say. Three ways of living your Christian life, okay? If we draw the circles in the sand to say this is a Christian life, we are living an empty Christian life. It is a Christian life that is the form without the function. You do it because it is the Christian thing to do, but there's no heart. This is the worst example. If you are just an indu- you know, the very industrial kind, right? It serves its purpose. You, know, you are passionate, you have the heart. You know, and wow, Yes, this is good. But the real gem is that when you have both the form and function. And I think that is the ultimate place that Jesus wants to guide us towards because you will be the ultimate testimony. And and this is what God wants to do. So let me just jump into this example to say that using the example of tap, that our lifestyle follows sanctification. If there is no function of sanctification, if in our heart all these things are not being worked on, then firstly, you don't meet the goals if it's just a form. If you are being worked on, and, but with, without the form, you know, it's just, I just live my own Christian life. Just like, ah, never mind, I don't care so much about the other things. That's good. You are living a life that's sanctified. But what Peter is trying to say here is that in your outward conduct, display godliness and holiness, both form and function. That the inner transformation is being lived out in such a beautiful way that everyone can see it. And you will be praiseworthy. You will be a testimony to God. And that is what we need to strive towards. So, okay, so in reality, okay, how does this look like? It's not easy to say all these wonderful things. But let's say the first two, okay, mission trip or holidays. Okay, drive a fancy car or a normal car, right? So we know we have a very cookie cutter kind of thing, okay? Uh, maybe it's just me, okay, but I, I am someone who really likes aesthetics. So many of our Christian friends, when they buy, you know, like five room flat, they just want it for the space, right? It's fine. But they don't do that much renovation. But to me, I like a nice house. I want to stay in a nice house. It comes from many, many years. Okay, sorry, dad and mom. Okay. It comes from many, 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 many years of staying in a plain house that I say finally that, well, I want a house. I want a nice house. Right? Renovate nicely. Make it nice. 
Raffles say, well, you can take the money and have a second child. Ah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but is it wrong? I think this is the crux that we need to ask ourselves when we live our lives. Because as they say, right, when the rubber hits the road, things are actually quite different. So what do you think a sanctified person should do in this sense? How should we choose to live our lives? You see, Ecclesiastes 5.19 says that God has also given us riches and wealth to every man and He has allowed them to enjoy them, to take His reward, to rejoice in His labour. And this is a gift from God. It is not wrong to enjoy things. If every single spare cash you have, you have kids, right? I don't know how many kids will we have already. Okay, you know how, much, how many kids I have? Probably still one because I know money. <laughs> just okay. <laughs> just, 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 just okay. Just okay. Okay, but, but there will be no end to giving, right? In the sense, you say like, like oh, why not if you have money to buy an expensive car, why don't you give to charity, you know? Or why don't you, you give? Like, there is no end to giving. Not giving is not wrong. God has given you these things to enjoy, right? But going back to the heart of the matter, that's why I say sanctification is not about the action. It is about the... The person. So a sanctified person will be a person who knows how to both enjoy God's blessings and to pursue the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That when the time comes for God to call you and say, I don't want you to buy these things. I want you to give it to the poor. You will do it. But when you sit down and say, Oh God, well, I really like this car. Can I buy it? And God says, sure. No. I've given you ability, you have worked hard, you are faithful. You know, enjoy some of the things that God has given, given you life. There are no issues there. But ultimately, it is the person. Who is the person making these decisions? They can criticize your actions all you want, but can they criticize the person? That is the ultimate question. Now, I want to move on to maybe a little bit more non-monetary stuff. And maybe at your jobs or in your schools, right, uh, uh, parents are very afraid of who their kids mix with, okay? So if you're a non-Christian friend or maybe you are a job where you are required to go and drink with your team and that kind of stuff like that, and then maybe your parents will say, no, la, quit that job, la, you know, like it's so ungodly, don't mix with these kind of people. Now, if we use that in every way, right, Christians are in the world but not of the world. We cannot say, oh, we don't mix, or oh, Christian only mix with Christian. Cannot, that's not what we are called to do, right? We are called to be out there to be salt and light of the world. We cannot just quit every single thing just because there is ungodly culture. But the question here is always boiling down to not the action, but the person. If you are a person whose sanctification will be reduced because of all these activities, then live for the sake of your own righteousness. Live so that you will not lose your salvation. But if you are a person that has that strength, that cornerstone that you stand upon that is unshakable and God wants you to be there, to be a light in the darkness, then you must be there. You must be there to be a good testimony. It's not about the action. It is about the person living the life. Okay, I know this one probably we will be the most unhappy one. Okay, solo couples trip before marriage. So there, there are people who, a lot of people who before marriage, they take their wedding photos. Okay, I'm not... Signaling anyone, okay? Uh, another church, not another church. <laughs> okay. And you say, hey, you know what? You're just going to get married one month, right? So, just, we'll take wedding photo uh, overseas, you know? It's fine. It's... I'm not making a judgment call on that, okay? But in this kind of situation, I will say that when we need to live our lives with godly and holy conduct, Okay, the question that I want to ask is, what do you feel is more important? Okay, all things are permissible, but not everything is helpful. Okay, most important is that we should not be brought under the control of anything. If you feel that you must do it because the photos must be taken, then maybe you need to ask, are we under the control of those photos? Okay, or maybe I don't single out, okay, just all these like wedding photo couples, okay. If you are a student in school, like a youth, okay, under, I don't say TC, like, I say YA, okay. If you <laughs> and then you get together and everyone asks, hey, can, can we hold hand or can we kiss, ah? Uh? All that kind of stuff like that, right? I mean, 
I don't make a call, a judgment call here. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. What controls you? That's the if it's physical attraction. Okay, I'll just say it last, last la, Okay, last la. If it's lust that controls you, right? Then as Paul says, like, I will not be brought under the control of anything. If you want to kiss the person because you want to, you know, I really love you. And at this point in time, I just feel so much affection. I just want to like quick peck on your cheek. That's lovely, right? But if you're making out, then no lah. I mean, obviously not, right? That you're being brought under the control of lust. So reject all these things. So it's difficult for people to pinpoint how you should live your lives. But that's why today I'm telling you, I'm pointing at the person. At the person. Okay? And in closing today, be holy, be godly, and most importantly, be serious. Because this is the grace of God that has been extended to each and every one of us to experience His salvation, to experience His love. We should not take these things for granted, but to live to the best of our abilities, to marry both form and function, to be that gem of a Christian. Okay, so let's just close our eyes and we'll just close in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you. We know that the process of sanctification is a difficult one. But Lord, I pray that we will choose to walk a path that is difficult for one very simple reason, that Jesus chose a path that was so stressful for him that he sweat drops of blood. How can we say that we want to take an easy path? No. We live our lives as living sacrifices. We live our lives putting ourselves, our own desires, our hearts on the altar to say that, Lord, you live this life for me. It is not what I desire for myself, but what you desire in me. And Lord, I pray that we are people who enjoy the freedom of Christ, as Paul says. That we are not legalistic in drawing lines in the sand to say this is Christian, this is not Christian. That this legalism will be broken and will make way for the freedom in Christ to reveal the power of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of our lives. That we are the people who see God in His full glory in our lives because we pursue Him with our whole hearts, with our whole minds, and with all the ability that we have. So help us, Lord, to take all these things seriously. Help us to always consider that first and foremost, our conduct must be holy and must be godly. And it can only be achieved if it is Christ who lives in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just pass the time back to Samson.